Hello and welcome. This is a video on Pan's Labyrinth representation, which is designed to help you for the EDUCAS A-Level Film Studies exam, component two, section A, global film. And Pan's Labyrinth is one of the choices for European films. This question is worth 40 marks in the exam, which means you need to spend at least one hour writing your response, and that averages out at 30 minutes per film. And this is one of the unusual parts of the exam because there is no specialist study area. It's just the three core concepts, and to remind you what those are, that's film form, meaning and response, which includes representation and aesthetics, and lastly, context. I'm hoping to make videos in the future which look specifically just at film form and context and aesthetics for Pan's Labyrinth. This video is gonna focus on representation. However, I am gonna to touch on aspects of film form, meaning and response, including aesthetics and context in this video. And before we get started today, I should quickly say that if you haven't watched my video on representation, then you should quickly go and do that now then come back and watch this video because a lot of the ideas I'm gonna be discussing today in this video will make a whole lot more sense if you have watched that video on representation in general. Before we get started on representation, I've got a couple of books and some films that I'm gonna recommend. So the first book that I'd recommend is the BFI Film Classic series, the one on Pan's Labyrinth, which is written by Mar Diestro Dopido. I'd also recommend that you check out Carol Clover's book, Men, Women and Chainsaws. There's some interesting stuff in there on phallic appropriation, which is definitely relevant to Pan's Labyrinth. And the last book that I'm gonna recommend is this one. It's Barbara Creed, The Monstrous Feminine, and this is all about representation of women in horror films. And for films, I would recommend that you would check out some other Guillermo del Toro films, in particular, The Shape of Water, also Kronos and The Devil's Backbone. And The Devil's Backbone is described as a bit of a companion piece to Pan's Labyrinth, so that's certainly worth checking out. Okay, so now finally on to Pan's Labyrinth and its representation of gender. So I would say that there are definitely characters in the film who conform to traditional or stereotypical representations of gender. So the first one I'm going to discuss is Carmen, uh, Ophelia's mother in the film. And I think that she in many ways is the embodiment of the stereotypical traditional representation of women. So to begin with, Carmen is a very submissive character. She goes along with what Vidal says and she doesn't question him, or if she does, she very, very quickly submits to his will. And we see this a couple of times in the film. Early on when we first see her and Vidal interact, she arrives at the compound, I guess you would call it, and Vidal asks her to use the wheelchair. She initially hesitates and resists and says, I don't need to, but then very, very quickly, after just a couple of words whispered in her ears, she submits to his will and sits down in the wheelchair, thereby making it possible for her to be literally and obviously metaphorically pushed around by men. It also helps to make her look physically lower than him in the scene, so therefore he has the height and therefore power advantage over her she is literally lower than him in the frame. She is quite a voiceless character in the film. We see during the banquet scene, she does go to speak, but Vidal very quickly shuts her down. No ha visto mucho mundo, ¿saben? Cree que a todos nos interesan estas tonterías. and reminds her, if you like, of her place in society as a woman in the Franco regime, that perhaps women like children, according to Vidal, uh, should be seen and not heard. And obviously she is a physically weak character. We see very early on, she coughs and her health worsens from that point on. There are several points in the film where she looks very physically weak and physically frail, and she obviously does eventually end up dying. And her death is off screen porque son inescrutables los caminos del Señor porque en su palabra y en su misterio se encierra la esencia de su misericordia porque si bien Dios nos envía el mensaje Está en nosotros el 
And so as Carmen is the very embodiment of traditional stereotypical representations of women, the film clearly shows us that this is not a good thing for women because if they do submit to a man's will, if they do stay silent, if they are physically weak and allow themselves to be literally pushed around by men, it will result in their literal or spiritual death. And in this way, Carmen is a symbol for all of the repressed women in Spain. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it under the Franco regime and a symbol for Spain itself. And whilst we're talking about symbolism in the film, the tree that Ophelia enters in the first task is very clearly a symbol for femininity. It's in the shape of a, a uterus, in the shape of a womb. And I would argue that this tree is a symbol for Carmen and for Spain itself and all repressed women. You're joking, not another one? So that when Ophelia goes in there and she sees that the tree is dying because of this greedy toad, which is occupying the inside of the tree, just in the same way that Franco regime and fascists and men like Vidal, the patriarchal structures, how they have the power and control over women and their reproductive birthrights. This has a negative impact on women until they eventually die. And in terms of traditional stereotypical representations of men, we need look no further than Captain Vidal. So what qualities might Vidal exhibit that we would associate with men in a stereotypical representation? Well, he is aggressive to the point of sadism. He's a very violent character at best when he inflicts violence on others, he does it completely without emotion, without feeling or compassion for the victims of that. At his very worst, he seems to actively enjoy inflicting violence on people, which is why I refer to him as being a sadistic character. He is clearly a very powerful character. Um, he is the head of the compound. He is Captain Vidal. And during a scene later on in the film, he points out that he is at the very, very top of the chain. No, let me just say Mírame a mí. Por encima de mí no hay nadie. Garcés. Sí, mi capitán. Si yo digo que este desgraciado se puede marchar, ¿me va a contradecir alguien? Nadie, mi capitán, se puede ir. He's an incredibly egotistical character and he loves masculinity and men and he has a complete disdain and disinterest in women. And I think this even extends to kind of a sexual attraction to women. His interactions with Carmen seem to be completely lacking in any attraction or romance whatsoever. You get the sense that he merely coupled with Carmen in order to produce a male heir, that he had no physical sexual interest in her whatsoever. And we see that he doesn't care for her life at all. He says to Dr. Ferrero midway through the film, if it's a choice between saving my son and saving Carmen, I choose my son. And that is a clear example of him preferring men over women. Escúcheme bien. Si tiene que escoger, salve al niño. Este niño llevará mi nombre. Y el nombre de mi padre, sálvelo a él. And one of the uncomfortable things I'm going to point out now is perhaps the most excited or aroused, if you like, that Vidal appears to get is when he is about to torture people. So when he is about to torture the, the stuttering soldier and when he is about to torture Mercedes, the way that he unbuttons his shirt and takes off his braces appears to be almost a pre-coital disrobing and the way that he kind of goes through the tools and eventually kind of produces this succession of phallic objects um, suggests that perhaps his torturing of people is almost sexually thrilling to him. And in terms of his love of men and masculinity and, and the patriarchy, that's very clear. As mentioned, he said that he wants to save his son's life. He is completely obsessed with having a son. He is absolutely certain that the child will be male. Un hijo debe nacer donde quiera que esté su padre. Eso es todo. Otra cosa, capitán. ¿Quién le ha dicho a usted que la criatura es un varón? <laughs> no me joda. Not only that, he's obsessed with his own father. So in this way, he almost worships patriarchy, his father, himself, his son, and the idea of this male lineage, which he sees extending far beyond his lifetime. And that's all that he cares about. Los hombres de la tropa decían que cuando el general Vidal murió en el campo de batalla, estrelló su reloj contra el suelo para que constara la hora exacta de su muerte. 
para que su hijo supiera cómo muere un valiente. Habladurías. Nunca tuvo un reloj. Decidle a mi hijo. Decidle a qué hora murió su padre. Decidle que yo. No. Ni siquiera sabrá tu nombre. And as mentioned, he is an incredibly violent character and it is not shown as being a positive trait. His aggression, his violence is immediately shown as being unjust and cruel. So very early in the film, Vidal is asked to come and look at some farmers who are suspected of being rebels. He kills them in an incredibly brutal fashion. The use of non-diegetic score in this moment is chilling. It makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. It cuts to low angle close up shots of Vidal's completely dispassionate face. We also see in close up the shots of the young boy having his face caved in with this bottle and the use of visual effects and makeup and also the diegetic sound of the bone crushing and the blood is completely disgusting. <laughs> And it's a very clear indicator that this film represents male aggression as being a hideous, deplorable thing. And as mentioned, he is a very powerful character. He's the most powerful character in the film, something that he alludes to when he is talking to the stuttering soldier. But we also see it in the shot compositions. He is often shot in close up. He will be in the foreground of the frame with his men behind him. And also when we see him at the banquet scene, he obviously sits at the head of the table. But the film is at pains to point out that Vidal's power is a tyrannous and unjust power. It's a power which does not benefit the many, it benefits the few. And as such, it is completely corrupt and unfair. And the film is suggesting that it should no longer be accepted. And so whilst Vidal is very much the traditional representation of a man, the film is very clear in saying that these qualities in men are not to be desired. They are not positive qualities. They are in fact monstrous. And Vidal is represented symbolically by monsters throughout the film, most notably the pale man scene where we have previously seen Vidal sitting at the head of the table. And then later in the film, the same composition is echoed later with the pale man sitting at the head of the table. So the comparison is clear. This type of man, this traditional man is a monster and should be stopped. So this is the end of part one on my video on Pan's Labyrinth and Representation. I'll post a link to part two in the description below.